Ladies and gentlemen, every four years at about this time, we begin to hear louder and louder appeals for national unity. We hear them between presidential elections as well, particularly when something is about to be put over on us, though they are uttered in a more perfunctory manner. Observe, however, that in recent years, it has become fashionable to disparage unity between elections and to praise dissent as a kind of moral or patriotic duty. But the pattern of a presidential election remained the same. First, there is a campaign in which the candidates denounce each other and seem to appeal to some sort of unstated principles. Then, when the election is over, the appeals become, in effect, now let's forget all about principles, national unity comes first. This is, therefore, an appropriate time to examine the issue of national unity and to ask certain questions. Is such unity necessary? Is it possible? What makes it possible? What is the alternative? What are the consequences? The present election campaign offers many clues to the answers. As in the case of many other errors or evils, today's appeals for national unity are based on a perverted element of truth. It is true that in order to exist as a nation, the large number of men who live in the same geographical area and deal with one another must agree on some fundamental principle or principles. And more, any two men who choose to deal with each other must have some sort of basic agreement, at least for the duration of their joint action. If you join forces with another man in order to leap a heavy boulder, and you strain to lift it, while he strained to push it down, nothing would come of both your efforts but failure, frustration, and if the issue were important enough to both of you, the recourse to blows and mutual extermination. The fact that in case of disagreement, man can resort to physical force, that is to human destruction, is the reason why every human association is based on some sort of agreement, which is implemented by certain rules of conduct. An agreement in this context does not necessarily mean a common purpose. You may make an agreement with a neighbor that you will not attack him so long as he does not attack you, and if both of you abide by it, you are free to go your own ways and perhaps never see each other again. The fundamental agreement which is required of a nation is an agreement on the rules of peaceful coexistence. A territory inhabited by men engaged in perpetual conflicts, chronic fighting, physical violence, and general hatred of all for all is not a nation nor a country, but a bloody mess. Internal peace and some sort of harmony are the precondition of the existence of a nation. The big questions, however, are peace at what price? Harmony on what terms? Agreement about what? And more, can such terms and agreements be chosen arbitrarily? Can men choose any terms and make them work simply by wishing them to do so? Or are there objective factors which necessitate certain principles of human association and defeat all others? In sum, the fundamental social question is what principles should men agree upon in order to live and deal with one another? The best way to answer a question of this kind is to start not with an enormous floating abstraction such as society as a whole, but with one member of society, the one you know best, yourself. Ask yourself, what rules of conduct would you be able and willing to accept in order to deal with your neighbors?
Let us say you are a young man who knows that he must work in order to support his life. You have a good job, a small family, and a home in the suburbs. Since you do not intend to stagnate, you maintain a certain financial and intellectual balance between the present and the future. You budget your money and your time. Your money to provide for your present needs and to improve your standard of living, for example, to pay off the mortgage on your home. Your time to do your present job well and to study in order to qualify for a better one. You like some of your neighbors and you dislike others, but you are not afraid of any of them. They are not a threat to you, nor you to them. This is the normal pattern of your life, and you take it for granted as if it were a fact of nature. But it is not. It took thousands and thousands of years to achieve it. Let us see what it depends on. Suppose this country's political system was changed. It was decided that the affairs of each community are to be determined at a monthly meeting of all its citizens by general democratic vote and that the rule of the majority is absolute, without limits or appeal. It would mean that you could be thrown out of your home and out of your community if the majority so voted. It would mean that you could be sentenced to die if, not liking your manners or your ideas, the majority so voted. This is not fantasy. This was the social system of many Greek city-states, pure democracy, unlimited majority rule. Would you agree to accept it in the name of communi communal unity? No? Then would you agree to accept it on a much larger scale and by remote control? Suppose it was decided, but never announced openly and explicitly, that the nation holds the absolute power of a Greek city-state. But since one cannot convene an entire nation to a monthly meeting, the people are compressed into groups representing various interests, and the government acts as arbiter and ruler, who listens to their clashing demands and enforces the will of those it deems to be representative of the public interest. These groups are not elected they are formed informally, uh, spontaneously, democratically. Anyone is free to form them and to clamor demands for anything. How will you adjust to it? First, there is a business lobby, but you don't mind it, it helps your boss. Then there is a labor lobby, but you don't mind it, it helps you. Then there is a farm lobby, but you don't notice it, it's too remote from your activities. Then a neighbor on the next block forms a group demanding better roads, and two blocks further, a woman forms a group demanding better schools. Another group demands free lunches for all school children, and a rival group demands free textbooks. Your windows are smashed one night by the group of the local juvenile delinquent or problem adolescent. <laughs> They shout non-negotiable demands, which you cannot quite untangle, but you gather it has something to do with youth power. The residents of the local old folks' home form a group demanding senior citizen power. The old maid file clerk at the office, whom you can't stand because she can't keep the file straight, is given a promotion with the help of a group that demands the liberation of women. You have no time to keep track of it all. You notice only that your taxes keep rising and rising and your money keeps buying less and less. You are late getting to the office one morning because the local welfare recipients group lies stretched out across the highway <laughs> demanding a yearly income greater than half of yours. You slam on the brakes just in time to avoid running over the group's leader, a lady known as Fetzo, who has... <laughs> who 
a lady known as Fetzel who has 12 children and no visible husband. <laughs> you had planned to have three children, but you decide to wait a little for that third one. You cannot afford him. A long-haired young man forms a group to forbid anyone to have more than two children, and a short-haired young woman forms a group to forbid abortion and the use of contraceptives. There's a group that demands a display of sexual intercourse on the screen, and another group that demands censorship of all movies above the intellectual level of a six-year-old. <laughs> so you give up going to the movies. You fall behind in your mortgage payment, but your property taxes keep rising and rising. You consider giving up your house and renting one in a new development five miles away. But the local bird watchers group is suing the developer, demanding that the land he cleared be turned into a public park. Your boss has promised you a promotion the job of managing the new branch factory he is planning to build in your district. But he does not build it. The lady who used to head the local poetry club now has a group that demands the preservation of the beautiful swamp he was going to fill. <laughs> then an educational group decrees that you cannot send your children to the local school, which so much of your property taxes has gone to pay for. So your children are bused to a distant town, a daily trip of two hours going there and another two hours coming back. This, you are told, will achieve racial integration. You had never thought of it before, but you become race conscious and try to untangle your own ancestry. You find it so mixed that you cannot qualify for any of the groups into which your community is fit. <laughs> the Afro-Americans, the Chicano-Americans, the Italo-Americans, the Jewish-Americans, the Irish-Americans, etc. And you, you are just a mongrel American. <laughs> So am I. A title, a title of which you would have been proud at one time, but which is becoming dangerous. If you lose your job, there will be no preferential quota to help you get another one, and no way of knowing how many ethnic applicants will be pushed ahead of you. There will be no preferential quota for your son's admission to a college when the time comes. You are alone, unprotected, defenseless, and the only reason you know that you are living in a human society and not on a desert island is the fact that your taxes keep rising and rising. <laughs> How do you adjust to whom and to what? The first thing to go is your future. You can barely keep up with your current expenses. You have no way to plan ahead. If you try to save, you do not know which demands or which groups will eat up your savings in the form of new taxes and higher prices. Why study to develop your skills? You do not know whether you will ever get a better job or what new obstacles will spring up overnight or whether there will be anyone left to hire you. You used to plan your course in terms of years. The range of your concern shrinks to one year, then to one month, and then to next payday. You can see nothing beyond but a black void. Strange things happen to a man without a future. You begin to act like the type of man you had once despised. You become sloppy at your job. You can barely summon the effort just to get by. You get drunk too often. You buy a luxurious lawnmower which you have no time to use, and you quarrel with your wife over the expensive cut, cut of lamb chops she bought for dinner. And when you hear a seedy lecturer at a group meeting 
declares the Horatio Alger stories are a myth that a man cannot rise by individual effort and ability, you applaud defiantly and belligerently. Oh yes, you have joined a group. You have joined several groups. You do not know exactly what they stand for, but they talk of community action and mutual protection, and they denounce other groups. You do not know clearly which ones or why. You had tried to get it clear, but gave up. Every time you read a newspaper or listen to the snarling voices on television, things grow murkier. You do not know by what steps your attitude toward your neighbors has changed. You have begun to watch them suspiciously. Whenever you see two of them in a heated discussion or observe several cars parked in front of a house, you feel a touch of anxiety. You do not know what they might be up to, what new group might be formed, and what it will do to you. You learn to feel fear. You are afraid of your neighbors, of any human being. You are afraid to speak. You smile and you agree with everyone you meet. You are afraid to think. One day, you discover that what you feel for men is hatred. In rare moments, you wonder what has happened to your neighbors. They were decent people once, you remember vaguely. They did not act like wild packs scrambling to get at one another's throats and pockets. You do not know how many of them are wondering the same thing about you. You know only that there was a time when the local bird watcher and the problem adolescent and the poetry club ladies and Ms. Fatso were of no danger to anyone, but now they are. Why were they better in the past? If someone answered, because they did not have a gun, you would not understand it. You have come to believe that people are no good and that force is the only practical way to deal with them. Since reason, they all tell you, has failed. You cannot cope with the enormous com complexity of an entire nation's problems. You have no way of knowing, you conclude, who is right or wrong, so let some groups force others and reestablish order. No one has explained to you that the golden rule applies to politics. If certain conditions of social existence are unacceptable and unbearable to you, you cannot expect others to accept them and make them work. And what these conditions do to you, they do to society as a whole. Do you agree to accept a social system of this kind it is, of course, the system under which we are living today, but which we have never chosen. It is important to consider it now because in the coming presidential election, one of the candidates is asking us to agree and in the name of national unity, explicitly to accept the principle that society has an unlimited power and that our lives belong to the state. Among many other issues which he exemplifies, George McGovern offers us a clear example of the fact that paradoxically enough, statism is incompatible with national unity. If by unity, we mean man's peaceful coexistence. Supposing for a moment that one wanted to unite with McGovern and support his programs, which McGovern and which programs would one join? <laughs> Since both keep switching every few weeks, it is bad enough if a president changes his policies while in office, as Mr. Nixon did. But a man who cannot hold a steady set of convictions for the three months of an election campaign <laughs> makes Mr. Nixon look like the Rock of Gibraltar. <laughs> a 
At the moment, McGovern is trying to justify himself by declaring in television advertisements that a man should not be afraid to change his mind. True enough, but not as a chronic policy. <laughs> and not if he is a presidential candidate who demands an unprecedented power, the total power to dispose of our incomes and therefore of our lives. Yes, he is free to change his mind, but what does this do to the minds of his followers? Obviously, what he expects of them is not the agreement, the unity, that comes from reasoned convictions, but faith in him, that is, unthinking obedience. This is a simple example of the connection between man's mind and his rights. Those who refuse to recognize individual rights are necessarily obliged to seek to destroy individual intelligence. How else would they obtain unthinking obedience? The goose-stepping automatons of Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia are not the exponents of a nation's unity, but of a nation's death. There are two crucial problems in human relationships, and the issue of national unity depends on their proper solution, the factor of force and the factor of time. The first involves the realm of criminals and despots. The second involves the realm of man's mind. As a being of rational, that is conceptual consciousness, man is unable to live like an animal on the range of the immediate moment. He is unable to live exclusively in the present. Some projection of the future, no matter how primitive, is a necessity of his mental and physical survival. If you point to the hippies with their now slogans as evidence to the contrary, I shall claim them as evidence to support my contention. Observe their epidemic of drug addiction, which is an attempt to escape from an unbearable mental state. Man lives by means of projecting the future, that is, projecting goals and taking the actions necessary to achieve them. This is a process enacted in time, and it requires the conviction that the goal will remain achievable. If a primitive savage spends days or months hewing a stone weapon, it is because he knows that he needs it to hunt with. If a primitive settler spends mo most of the year tilling the soil and planting, it is because he knows that it is necessary in order to collect the harvest. Both know that their success is not guaranteed, that some calamity of nature may defeat their efforts. But they know that they can learn to deal with nature and that nature gives them a chance to get the products of their hunting or planting. What men do not know and have not learned fully to this day is whether they will be able to keep their products once they get them. The problem of human predators is as old as recorded history or older. When men learn to hunt or to plant, some men learn to avoid that effort, to seize the products of others by force. The early forms of human association, such as primitive tribes, were prompted in large part by the need for self-protection against the attacks of human enemies, with the tribal ruler as the chief warrior. How to organize protection against the use of force was and is man's fundamental social problem. What has to be protected is man's time, time free from possible interference with the process of production and of its goal consumption. Without self-protection, man would be unable to produce or to survive. The need for organized protection against force is the root of the need for a government. In the history of Western civilization, the period known as the Dark Ages after the fall of the Roman Empire was a period when Western Europe existed without any social organization beyond chance local groupings clustered around small villages, large castles, and remnants of various traditions, swept periodically by massive barbarian invasions warring robber bands and sundry local looters. It was as close to a state of pure anarchy as men could come. 
the feudal system grew out of the need for organized protection. The system, in essence, consisted in the peasants swearing allegiance to a lord who claimed ownership of the land and a percentage of their harvest in exchange for his duty to protect them against military attacks. This system brought some semblance of order, but no protection and no peace. Disarmed men were left in the total power of an armed ruler who had his own military gang and who robbed them as ruthlessly as, but more systematically than any foreign invader. The history of the Middle Ages is a series of internal and external wars. There were various lords struggling to enlarge their domains, foreign lords struggling to subjugate neighboring lands, and bloody, hopeless uprisings of desperate peasants bloodily suppressed. It was also the longest period of stagnation, intellectually and productively, in Europe's history. The Renaissance was the great rebirth intellectually, but not politically. Still seeking order and unity, men attempted to solve the problem of feudal tyranny by replacing many small tyrants with a single big one. This was the birth of modern absolute monarchies. The rule of force continued externally and internally. Externally, it took the form of perpetual wars among various monarchs seeking to conquer the kingdoms of other monarchs. Internally, bloody terror as a way of life was moved, in effect, to society's upper levels. This is not to say that the people as a whole were exempt. The people were crushed in the serfdom of hopeless toil and helpless obedience. But those who declare today that force is the only way to deal with men, with the unstated footnote that they, the speakers, would be safe in the position of rulers, ought to take a careful look at the history of absolute monarchies and of modern dictatorships as well. Under the rule of force, it is the rulers who are in greatest danger, who live and die in permanent terror. The court intrigues, the plots and counterplots, the coup d'etat, the known assist executions and secret assassinations are a matter of record. So are the purges of party leaders and their cliques in Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia. National unity, peace and harmony among men. If the history of animals were recorded, the most ferocious species would not equal the carnage perpetrated by men when they choose force as their means of dealing with one another. It is in this context from the perspective of the bloody millennia of mankind's history that I want you to look at the birth of a miracle, the United States of America. If it is ever proper for men to kneel, we should kneel when we read the Declaration of Independence. The concept of individual rights is so prodigious a feat of political thinking that few men grasp it fully, and 200 years have not been enough for other countries to understand it. But this is the concept to which we owe our lives, the concept which made it possible for us to bring into reality everything of value that any of us did or will achieve or experience. This is the key and the only key to the problem of national unity. If men seek peaceful coexistence, they must accept the principle that every man has rights which other men may not infringe, that he has the right to exist for his own sake and to pursue his own happiness, that he is an end in himself, not the means to the ends of others, not of any others, big or small, strong or weak, neither as canon father nor as unrewarded drone toiling to support the feudal lord or the king or the emperor or the children of welfare recipients. I 
I shall not repeat here what rights are, how to define them, and how to implement them. I refer you to my book, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. I shall merely remind you that the only rule of conduct men must accept if they wish to achieve peaceful coexistence is the rule that none may initiate the use of physical force against others. The rest is a matter of consistent implementation, the first step of which is to delegate to the government the right to use force in retaliation and only in retaliation. This is necessary in order to take the homicidal power, force, out of the reach of human whims and human irrationality and place it under the control of objective laws. Benevolence is incompatible with fear. It is only when a man knows that his neighbors have no power forcibly to interfere with his life that he can have feel benevolence toward them and they toward him, as the history of the American people has demonstrated. The freest people on earth was the most benevolent and the most generous, fearlessly and innocently too generous. Since agreement on the principle of individual rights does not impose any official dogma and does not violate anyone's convictions, the greatest variety of views and ideas could coexist peacefully in the same country without threatening anyone. If two men disagreed, they were free not to deal with each other and neither could force his choices on the other. Incidentally, this applied even to the man who refuses to respect individual rights, that is the criminal. If he chose to initiate the use of force, he was answered on the terms he had chosen, that is by force. The recognition of individual rights is the only proper principle of human coexistence because it rests on man's nature, that is the nature and requirements of a conceptual consciousness. Man gains enormous values from dealing with other men. Living in a human society is his proper way of life, but only on certain conditions. Man is not a lone wolf and he is not a social animal. He is a contractual animal. He has to plan his life long range, make his own choices, and deal with other men by voluntary agreement and he has to be able to rely on their observance of the agreements they entered. National unity, like love, is not a primary but a consequence and must come voluntarily or not at all. Just as one cannot order a child to love his mother, and if one does, one will make him hate her, so one cannot order or urge a nation to unite. When a politician's demands for unity violate your convictions, when he claims that unity supersedes your judgment, when he urges you to support policies which you oppose, to participate in actions you regard as evil, to join your own destroyers, or to leap into a sacrificial furnace, <coughs> all in the name of national unity, then pretense, hypocrisy, corruption, Hatred and national disintegration will be the only results. <coughs> it is the last remnants of the principle of individual rights and therefore any remnants of national unity that George McGovern is avowedly out to destroy. While some of his followers were demanding an unearned annual income of $6,500 for welfare recipients, McGovern was advocating a proposal, which he was later obliged to change, that all income above $12,000 a year be expropriated. This meant that the best, the ablest, the most hardworking, the most productive Americans would be left with less than double the income and standard of living of welfare recipients. Such a proposal is the confession of a mentality totally devoid of the concept of individual rights and of justice.
as to his concept of national unity, it was McGovern who rewrote the Democratic Convention rules, which enabled his boys to stack the delegations by means of preferential quotas given to some minority pressure groups, not all pressure groups, only those that agreed with his views. He was helped by the ideological weakness of the other candidates and by a gang of sundry young manipulators, power lusters, and hippies who publicized themselves as a grassroots movement. <laughs> he seized the nomination by crudely, ruthlessly divisive tactics, denouncing, insulting, and shoving aside all the established factions of the Democratic Party. Then, when he found that his grassroots turned out to be weed roots. <laughs> that the country was not receptive to his campaign, he came begging his own victims to help him in the name of party unity. It is hard to say who lacked integrity more shamefully, McGovern, or Humphrey, Musky, and even sad little Eagleton, who were dragged out to campaign for a man they had good reason to despise. This is the kind of unity McGovern hopes to extort from the nation. As a political candidate, George McGovern is a fiction-like concretization of certain abstractions. He is the perfect embodiment of the soul of modern American intellectuals. This is not to say that he is an intellectual, <laughs> but neither are they. It is not an attractive soul, and he projects too many of its essential characteristics. Pretentiousness, uncertainty, inconsistency, borrowed notions, and therefore contempt for ideas, a vacuum of values and feeling hidden under the tritest sentimentality, a patronizing attitude toward the people, a seizing hostility, and above all, an enormous distance from reality. I offer in evidence the fact that a campaign which had been announced as a crusade for momentous issues, for revolutionary change, for re-establishing integrity and credibility in government, a crusade in the name of new politics led by a candidate publicized as an idealist, started at the bottom of the old politics and went on down. <laughs> No issues were raised or discussed except for a few evasive snatches. We have heard nothing but personal denunciations, insults, attacks, and irresponsible smears. A smear is an accusation without particulars or proof, such as the claim that the Nixon administration is, quote, the most corrupt in our history, unquote. A campaign dedicated to love has dissolved into shrieks of hatred and the worst kind of rebel arousing. The attempt to arouse hatred for the rich. Is this the road to national unity? But McGovern has miscalculated. There is no rebel in America, only the synthetic rebel imagined by the intellectuals and manufactured by the universities. Out. out of a small percentage of the students. The intellectuals and McGovern's view of the people is a measure of their distance from reality. They do not see a modern nation. They see a nation of helpless peasants and cruel overbearing masters, and they long to play the role of overbearing but kindly masters. <laughs> They have perceived nothing in the last 200 years. This is an example of philosophically induced blindness. The philosophy still guiding modern intellectuals is of the pre-French Revolution era. 
their souls are still in Europe. They have missed the achievements of two great men, Aristotle and Christopher Columbus. <laughs> the patronizing attitude which regards the people as the masks, as helpless, whining, begging masses that plead for handouts from, from a benevolent ruler and wait for his permission to drag the rich to the guillotine is so dated that it would not work even in modern Europe. To preach that view in America is grotesque. The American people, including the poorest, have never regarded themselves as humble mendicants waiting to be helped, nor have they ever resented the rich and the successful. To most Americans, the successful are not objects of envy and hatred, but of inspiration. An American worker properly identifies with his boss, the industrialist, rather than with a welfare recipient. And, I would venture to guess, so do many welfare recipients. <laughs> accepting the group organizers or the professional bums who see welfare as a way of life. Americans are men of action. They do not indulge in self-pity and they do not accept passive resignation to suffering. In the face of hardships or misfortune, their automatic response is to act, to fight, to solve the problem an attitude for which they are so frequently condemned by the mystics of the intellectual elite of European bar rooms and basements. To confront Americans with the patronizing kindness of a combined social worker and small-time lord of the manor is such an impertinence that a landslide defeat is the least McGovern deserves for it. Here is the latest example of McGovern's view of the people and of national unity, as reported by the New York Times yesterday. McGovern stated, quote, let's face it, this election is more than a contest between George McGovern and Richard Nixon. It is a fundamental struggle between the little people of America and the big rich of America between the average working man or woman and a powerful elite." Close quote. I read this to my husband and said, there are no little people in America. He answered, well, there's George McGovern. <laughs> It is obvious. I'm sorry I didn't get it. May I suggest to that earnest young man there is a question period later. You raise your hand, I'll recognize you. You can put the question. It is obvious that McGovern had counted on hatred, on deliberately stimulating class hatred and hatred for Richard Nixon to unite the nation. It is revulsion against George McGovern that is uniting it now. Americans do not want any masters rulers, kindly or otherwise. Nor do they want any redistribution of wealth. Americans are a future-oriented people. It was not the socialistic rich, it was the workers who protested angrily against McGovern's proposal to expropriate inheritances. 
men who may never save more than a few thousand dollars to leave to their children, rebelled against the notion of forbidding multi-million dollar legacies. Do you think that this is optimistic self-delusion? No, it is hard-headed realism. Americans know the importance of having all doors and all roads kept open to them. McGovern and his intellectual supporters are obviously stunned and bewildered. They do not know which way to turn or how to explain the people's attitude. It seems incredible, but apparently they really thought that the people would follow them, which shows what degree of isolation from reality they had reached in their tight little cliques, their in-groups, their esoteric fads, their private establishments, their unintelligible sign language. After years of talking only to those who agreed with them, they came to believe that no one else existed and are now in a state of shock. <laughs> a very revealing article by, J by James Reston appeared in the New York Times, September 10, 1972, under the title, What Kind of People Are We? Quote, Candidates for the presidency make certain assumptions about the condition of the nation and the world, and particularly about what kind of people we are and what we think, or at least what we will swallow." Close quote. The administration assumes, Mr. Reston points out bitterly, that, quote, a majority of the people are fairly well off, close quote, and are opposed to McGovern's programs. Quote, it would be difficult to prove that the president has misjudged the popular mood. Welfare, which used to be a symbol of America's compassion, is now regarded by many not only as an administrative mess, mess which it is, but almost as a racket in which money is taken from the people who work to support the people who won't work, close quote, which is precisely what it is. What else can it be? Mr. Reston doesn't say. And further, quote, indifference to the massacre of human life in Vietnam, provided it is not American lives, is not exactly the ideal that set the American nation apart as the most unselfish and compassionate society in history. But so far in this election, there has been remarkably little response to Mr. McGovern's argument that we should end the war, reform the tax structure, redistribute the wealth, reconcile the races and the generations, and cut the defense budget, and do all these things because unity and justice at home are essential to the spiritual and physical security of the nation." Close quote. This is an unusually clear demonstration of the reason why altruism is incompatible with individual rights, with justice, and with national unity. Altruism demands sacrificial victims. What sort of unity can one establish between victims and executioners? What sort of unity does Mr. Reston envision? He demands that we unite on a program to end the war by surrender, to reform the tax structure by guaranteeing unearned incomes for some people at the expense of others, to redistribute wealth by confiscation, to reconcile the races and the generations by preferential quotas, to cut, to cut the defense budget by relying on the goodwill of Soviet Russia. Such is the nature and the loathsome evil of altruism, which is now on public display in the form of a program that an unconscionable candidate has had the effrontery to offer to the American people. An obscure Balkan nation would not accept it. A pack of cornered rats would not accept it. But the altruists believed that the American people would. Mr. Preston is wrong when he declares that, quote, there has been remarkably little response to Mr. McGovern's arguments, close quote, unless by response he means agreement. The response, as shown by the polls, has been overwhelming. 
It represents the American people's rejection of totalitarianism, the first time they got a clear smell of it. <laughs> it would be unfair and even silly uh, to indict the character of a whole people on the basis of the evidence in this campaign, says Mr. Reston, and proceeds to do it. <laughs> or rather, he struggles not to accept the fact that the American people could reject altruism, clearly implying that if they did, he would indict them. Quote, the people, he declares, can't see his McGovern's ideals and his proposals for his blunders. Maybe they long for the unity and justice and change he wants, close quote. He then blames McGovern for having failed to present his ideals effectively, with the implication that if the people had understood those ideals, they would have leaped joyously into a global sacrificial furnace. <laughs> quote, nevertheless, he declares, the main question remains, even if he argued his ideals effectively, would the American people in their present mood respond? Close quote. He is not too certain. I am. No human beings can accept altruism fully and consciously. That is, accept the role of sacrificial animals. The American people least of all. Their response to McGovern's program is a magnificent assertion of independence and self-esteem. It is obvious that altruism is the intellectual's only hope and their only weapon, a rusted, blunted, bloody weapon. It is embarrassing to hear the maudlin sentimentality of all those skeptics and cynics when they attempt to deal with values. Here is another sample from the Times, October 4, 1972. According to William B. Shannon, George McGovern has shown, quote, a candid, unneurotic, friendly personality, close quote, and is, quote, an experienced politician moving in the mainstream of the country's liberal tradition, close quote. After trying lamely to justify McGovern's switches and compromises, Mr. Shannon declares, quote, but in any event, a political leader's programs are not like a builder's blueprints. Rather, they are signposts on the road he hopes the country will travel. Through all the partisan smoke and clamor, Mr. McGovern's signposts are perfectly clear. He would lead the way to an America of peace, compassion, and concern for the hungry child and the ailing old persons, for the overtaxed, fed-up worker on the assembly line and the hard-pressed small farmer, for the malnourished Indian on the forgotten reservation and the unseen war orphan in the distant land. Unquote. What about compassion and concern for those who seek happiness in life? When will they have time for it? But an altruist wouldn't know what I'm talking about. In another aspect of his statement, however, Mr. Shannon hints at a valid point. It is true that political programs today are not like blueprints, but more like signposts. In a mixed economy, dominated by the philosophy of pragmatism, a political candidate does not dare proclaim clear-cut principles. He has to pay lip service to the notions of every pressure group and to the opposite of his own convictions, if any. This means that we, the voters, have to learn the art of lip-reading and make a choice, in effect, between two hypocrites by means of the signposts that indicate the nature of their hypocrisy as well as the road they actually want us to travel. This is not a procedure conducive to national unity, but at present we have no other. Well, by that criterion, both Mr. Nixon and Mr. McGovern are hypocrites. Both have paid tributes to Americanism, that is free enterprise, and to altruistic statism. But here is the difference between them. 
Mr. Nixon, though not a champion of free enterprise, yearns in that direction and does not mean his tributes to altruistic statism. Mr. McGovern does not mean his tributes to Americanism. In an alternative of this kind, there is only one choice for those who value individual rights. As you know, I am not an admirer of Mr. Nixon, but whatever his flaws, they are nothing when compared to his adversaries' perfectly clear signposts. It is against statism that we have to vote. It is statism that has to be defeated and defeated resoundingly. The American people apparently understand this. Left without any guidance, any intellectual leadership, any conceptual understanding, on the basis of nothing but their sense of life, they knew when to say no loudly and clearly. Now, more than ever, after this election, they will need the help of every honest, articulate person to translate their knowledge into firm, consistent, conceptual terms, because their sense of life is a magnificent foundation, but not a sufficient weapon to save the country. Now, more than ever, they will need a new philosophy. A year ago, in this hall, I was asked whether I held any hope for the future of this country. I answered yes and referred for my reasons to the article I was then writing. It is called Don't Let It Go, and it was published in the Ayn Rand letter of November 22nd and December 6, 1971. I would like you to read it or reread it now. It dealt with the sense of life of the American people. In the present campaign, the American people have confirmed and surpassed my best hopes. If I were religious, which I am not, I would say, God bless America. I am saying it anyway. This contains the question and answer session which followed Ayn Rand's October 1972 Ford Hall Forum talk, A Nation's Unity. May I say for the benefit of those who may be new to this audience and to these programs, the question period is conducted with great simplicity. I shall try to take a question or two from each section so as to cover the entire hall. When recognized, please stand so I can see you. And then remember always, you are the questioner. The speaker is on the platform. Right. Question, please. Yes. I'd like to know, Mr. President, of the type of campaign initiative that administration is about to get this gentleman would like to know your opinion of the type of campaign which Mr. Nixon is conducting against Mr. McGovern. Uh, as far as I know, it's uh, not quite as forceful as I would have made it, but there has been, uh, but uh, surprisingly and properly, he has not compromised nor me too, if anything's the other way around. Uh, and for instance, the statement, uh, I don't know if you heard it, that was on television in New York and probably here too, a half hour uh, speech by uh, Governor Connolly, uh, former Governor Connolly of Texas, was one of the best campaign speeches so far. Uh, so that I would say that the campaign is much better than the Republicans uh, had, been, had done in the past. It could have been much better. Another question here, this lady. Of which of your achievements are you proud of? Of which? Of your achievements, which one are you proudest of? I have never given it any thought. Uh, I don't measure it that way, but if you want, me, uh, on the spur of the moment, of having married Frank O'Connor. <laughs> Thank you. 
What constitutes a sanction? A sanction? Sanction. Oh, sanction. Yes. Uh, in the dictionary definition, it has two meanings. One is approval, uh, support, sponsorship. The other one, sometimes used in international politics, is almost the opposite. Like to invoke sanctions against the country means a blockade or a breach of diplomatic relationship or of trade. But the way I use the word sanction in a moral context uh, is always in the sense of approval or sponsorship. Question up here. Way up, I see a hand. I would like to ask your opinion on one, one uh, short issue. If I lived alone in a desert island or in a forest, I might be worth one log cabin. But in the U.S. today, since I am able to work with others, and since I am able to use capital accumulated by others before me, I can command quite an income. In what manner do you call, or do you assert, or do you believe that the taxation of this income is obnoxious, or that I have an inalienable right to this income, which are mine alone? In what way do you want to take to believe or to argue that the taxation on income is obnoxious and uh, this gentleman uh, uses as uh, his basic principle the assumption that he lived in a desert and also on an, in a forest and through <laughs> his... And had a, built himself a cabin, and then he moves to the extremity of a bit of civilization, and he speaks about the fact that he has built a cabin, and others have done likewise, and he has accumulated money, whether by inheritance or the rest. And he raises the question, by what right is this the fruit of his labors to be subject to taxes? I'm sorry if you haven't read Atlas Shrug, and I hate to recommend it. I'm sure it, it will not do you any good or you it. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's my duty to recommend it because you will find an answer to your question. I'll give you just a brief one. I would suggest that you check the premise whether left alone on a desert island you would build a log cabin if you use your mind in the manner you demonstrate in this question, namely by context dropping. Look, you would achieve no more on a desert island than you achieve in a free society. Because even though the material, the content of knowledge would be less, that knowledge in the most civilized society doesn't do you any good until your own mind has grasped it and then applied it. If you could build a log cabin on a desert island all by yourself, then in America you would probably build 10 skyscrapers, if that is the extent of your mind. But the people who come after you, no matter what knowledge you left them, will not be able to use it at all unless they learn from you and then apply their knowledge by their own independent work. That is the way in which we learn from past generation and teach future generation. What does this mean? That the only moral inheritance that we owe to those from whom we learn is to use our mind and keep the society free to let others' mind, other minds use it as they did. Uh, by what earthly means or right, the means I know, the gun, but by what earthly right does a society that, that is people who have not achieved anything and do not intend to, by what right would they seize anything above a log cabin in today's uh, civilization, let us say. There is no right of society taxation and there is no such thing as society, it is only men. The men who are entitled to their property is whatever they produce by their own thinking and effort and by contractual agreement with others. They are entitled 
to nothing else. altruism as an impossibility or as something that is undesirable? Uh, as an unspeakable evil would be exact. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, it, it is an impossibility if any naive man attempts voluntarily to practice. There is no such thing. However, it is a great possibility on the part of the executioners, not the victims. For an innocent man or a victim who would like to practice altruism, it is not possible unless he leaps into the first uh, pot where uh, cannibals are cooking a dinner. So long as he leaves, he's not an altruist. But just think of what the receivers of altruistic sacrifice can do. Altruism is the only excuse used, the only justification used by every dictatorship, every tyranny, every despotism, Nazi Germany, Soviet Russia, and today's American, I don't know what to call them, but they are not even liberals anymore. Every time you want something immoral, unearned and belonging to someone else, you try to invoke altruism. And in that way, it is very possible. And the sea of blood in history is the best demonstration of it. This gentleman. I know you just want Wait a minute. Start slow. <laughs> <laughs> I have a simple logical question. Do you view the cognitive relation in terms of intentionality, as such neocons as H.D. Beach, B-E-A-T-C-A. No. Will you? And I don't even know who he is, but I don't speak that kind of language. Intentionality, if you mean volition, yes. Please, Miss Rand, please. <laughs> Now, let's quiet down. I want you to put your question simply and don't seek an effect. <laughs> put it simply. You know what I mean. Now, put it simply. I'm sure it is, but put it very simply. No, no, put it very simply. I, I know, you're asking about the philosophy of Veach. What is the philosophy that Veach directs himself to so the audience can understand? I'll put it simply. Okay. All right, thank you. Put the question up here. Yes, way up, way up in the corner. All quiet, please. I can't hear you. Do you think it is important to be politically involved? And if you do think it, how do we tend to change our politics and politics? Do you think that it is important to become politically involved? And if you do think so, how would you go about changing our politics and our politicians? In the same, uh, no, first, on the first part of your question, no, I don't think it's important to be politically active today. I think it is crucially important to vote. If, uh, and whenever two candidates are more or less the same, then even that's not a duty if you can't make up your mind. But in an election like to, uh, this time, it is so clear-cut, even if neither side fully admits it, uh, that it, uh, to the extent to which you want to preserve your rights at all, you should vote. Now, how do I propose to change our politicians? I really don't, except to observe how they changed into what they are. So long as a country is even semi-free, the politicians are not its determining element. They are what the electorate or public opinion in effect makes them, or what they think public opinion wants of them. They have demonstrated that very clearly. 
Therefore, before one can in, engage in politics, one should engage in educational work. I have said that repeatedly. What we need is an educational campaign aimed to spread a new philosophy, to make people understand what are individual rights, why they are right, why altruism is wrong, and the battle should be conducted by every person who is articulate at all. If you understand your ideas, try to spread them to as many people as you can. That is how public opinion changes, and that will change politicians. But if you ask me about what social institution is mainly, as an institution, the cause of our problems, I would say the colleges and universities. If you want to reform any one institution, start there, because it's philosophy that really determines the culture, which determines the direction of a country, and philosophy is the specialty of the universities. That's where it comes from. That's who spreads it to every other profession. So if you want a crusade, start with the colleges. Further question on the other stand on the front. Uh, the friend, have you heard of the Libertarian Party? And would you consider a joint in John Hosford's and Tony Hayes as presidential candidate? Have you heard have you heard of the Liberation Party? <laughs> Is that right? The what? Libertarian. Libertarian Party. Look, I would uh, rather vote for Bob Hope or the Marx Brothers if they still existed or Jerry Lewis. I don't know who is the funniest today. But rather than something like Professor Hospers and the Libertarian Party. Look, I don't think Henry Wallace is a great thinker, but even he... And uh, he's pretty much of a demagogue, so with some courage. Even he had the good sense to stay home this time if he wanted, to some extent, if he had one ounce on sincerity and wanted some freedom for this country, to choose this year to start after personal publicity. And if Hospers and whoever the rest are get 10 votes away from Nixon, which I doubt, but if they do, it is a moral crime, not at a time like this. Who cares about Nixon personally and less about Haspers personally? This is not the time to engage in personal publicity seeking, which all that type of rump crank political parties are engaging in. Publicity is all that they want to achieve and this is not the time for it. If they want to spread their ideas, do it by educational work. Don't run for, pre for president or even for dog catcher if you're going to help McGovern that way. This gentleman, this gentleman suggests, and see if I've got it, this gentleman suggests that both candidates, Nixon and McGovern, have contradicted themselves. And he wonders how one knows who is the better one to vote for when each one in turn has been self-contradictory. Well, I, in effect, answered that at the uh, last part of my speech. Namely, in a mixed economy, you will never get a fully consistent candidate. So uh, everybody will be, in part, contradicting himself. So all that one can really do is observe the total of a political figure's uh, speeches, uh, policies, actions, and decide what does he really mean, what is his main line, what's his, the dominant line and then hope for the best. And Nixon is certainly not a great example of consistency, but look, 
he hasn't. He has never had the nerve to attempt to ask for a redistribution of your wealth. He has never asked for power. Observe that he is a man who is singularly not a power luster. That's not... <laughs> what power has he asked for? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. In answer to your question as to what power he has sought, the suggestion has come from an irritated spectator, <laughs> namely wage and price control. Oh, certainly that is a vicious program, but that he wasn't asking for personal power. I mean a man who wants to control your personal life. I spoke about the wage and price controls here uh, a year ago. I'm as opposed to it as I can be, but observe he hasn't even enforced those controls, fortunately. I wouldn't think it's impossible that he will, but he is not doing it to seek personal power. If you look at one close-up of McGovern, you know that that's what he's after. Because nobody... Nobody can advocate the right to prescribe how much money are men entitled to make and then grab everything else. That proposal of 12000 a year is a monstrous proposal. It is really worse than communism. Why I will refer you to articles I wrote on that subject in the Ayn Rand letter. I can't make a long lecture of it now. But it is an unspeakable proposal which he then very quickly had to, of course, retract. But to answer, uh, to finish your question, the only way you can really judge today's hip hypocrites is look not at the details, but at their basic principles. What kind of fundamental, that is a principle affecting a great part of your life and, on, and of the country, what he keeps sticking to consistently, and judge him by that. Nixon is not much, and I'm not en endorsing him enthusiastically. What I'm endorsing is individual rights. And when you smell a collectivist, then you have to fight for your life. And McGovern is certain as that. That's putting it mildly. Are your plays ideal and think twice available, and if not, why not, and if so, where? Uh, available in print, no. Why not? Because someday I might see them produced. <laughs> that's, that's not a promise, but it might Wait happen. No, I say it's not a yeah. promise. Quiet, I don't yeah. know, but All it right. might happen. <laughs> Will you tell us about the progress of the film production of... I'm sorry, I cannot. Atlas Shrugged. <laughs> yes. No on. contract has yet been signed. That is all I can say at present. No, no, this lady right there. Come on. I would say it's not a certain means. There's trouble. Come on. May, may we have quiet, please? In your open letter to Boris Kosky, you said that games are an important part of man's life, that they provide a necessary reference for political work. You also said that a man who plays each other with successes uses the hits and escape from the other. The implication is that it is not a life-oriented and appropriate profession for the part day. Is that true, and how can that be applied to the court as a I have a question, believe it or not. <laughs> now you listen and see whether I have it. If I haven't got it, raise your hand. But this uh, lady suggests that in one of the articles you wrote for your uh, fortnightly, you had an open letter to Boris Spassky in which you expressed the opinion uh, that 
the enthusiasm about chess was really, in some ways, an escape from reality. And... Well, that's why it went to Boris Spassky, because uh, the going into chess as a profession was an escape from reality, and the lady asked whether or not this can consistently be applied to all other sports, uh, where a person goes into sports as a profession. Would this be your opinion that they too are seeking to escape from reality? No, and I touched on that though briefly in the article you quote. You see, if uh, men become professional sportsmen, it improves their skill in the particular respect which uh, is involved, like uh, if a man is a champion runner. That means that in non-sports life, he runs well. Uh, and then what he wants to use that ability for, it's up to him. There's, it's not an escape to be a champion uh, sportsman. But the peculiar paradox in chess is that the man, which is supposed to be an intellectual sport, that the men who go into it professionally destroys their intellectual capacity for intellectual understanding of any other field. Now, I don't mean that it's necessarily so in every case, but in most cases, the men who are brilliant intellectually at chess are naive, helpless, and mystical in other realms of life. In other words, they concentrate their intellect on one particular activity, and do not de which activity doesn't develop their capacity intellectually. For the rest of their existence, it does the opposite. It confines it. Now, I am not saying it necessarily has to do so, but in such cases as we know of, it seems to be the choice of those who go into professional chess player. Uh, as to just playing the game as a relaxation, nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it if you are a professional, if you use the same amount, or at least half, if you're not interested, of your intellect on other issues of life, but not behave like Bobby Fischer. I admire him tremendously. I happened to see him on TV. I was startled by the enormous intelligence he projected, which makes it more tragic, because a man with that ability shouldn't be running around it was, uh, well, not Russia, he hates Russia, but Yugoslavia and all the other countries, he doesn't care, and he belongs to some mystical sect. Uh, for a man of his brain, that's not innocent, you see. That obviously is an escape, and that's what I object to in the case of all those potentially very brilliant minds. Further question? Come on. This gentleman in front. Come on. Uh, the question turns as to whom you contemplated to act in the picture of Atlas Shrug. The answer is I didn't. Thank you. I thought it would it's be. Would yes, much come on. too premature anyway. Now it's the third question over here. Yes? Can you say anything about the What do you think of uh, Mr. Ellsberg's expose of the Pentagon Papers? Not very much. <laughs> Not of his particular action. I have barely even followed whatever it is he thinks he is doing. Uh, I don't know and care less. As to the Pentagon Papers themselves, well, you know, it's fairly, it was fairly obvious if you read the papers at the time what was going on. And that if anybody should be disgraced now, it's actually the press. Because why didn't they report it at the time? It, they may not have had the verbatim conversation of some private councils, but they certainly saw the trend and events. And an awful lot of verbatim statements from the people being exposed now were sometimes published on the back pages somewhere. I think the 
first disgrace is, of course, to the American press. Uh, I mean, as a result of those papers, and the rest to democratic presidents. And now there's going to be a third one. Further question here? Come on. Uh, you said the yes, that you served the national guidelines that are still hold the most the country. Why is that? Why do you... <laughs> you said at the conclusion of the third Ayn Rand newsletter that you still held some hope for the country. Why? Well, because uh, I have spent about two weeks of working all night, once till literally eight in the morning, to write the answer in my newsletter. It will be a long article in two parts, and I cannot state briefly uh, the, the reasons in the manner I will state them in the letter. I can only indicate one thing. If you know what I mean by a concept of a sense of life, which is a subconscious, subverbal philosophy, the sense of life of this country, which really means the influence of the original philosophy of this country, is not like the European one. In fact, in many respects, it's the opposite. And therefore, what they got away with Europe, they cannot get away with here. By they, I mean the collectivists and the status. Not today. And as I say in the conclusion of my article, since subconscious premises or philosophy is not an eternal endowment, take a couple more generations educated as they are today, and it's possible the dictatorship would be feasible even in this country, because then people are subconsciously conditioned to the type of premise that destroyed Europe. I don't think they can succeed yet. What I do think is that we can be in terrible trouble. It is possible we would have a civil war fought blindly by contestants who would know what they're fighting for. Anything is possible, but not dictatorship. That I don't think would hold here. The American people are still too free-minded, too individual, and as I say in my article, they don't like being pushed around. It's a very good sign that it's an American expression. You'd never hear it in Europe. For further detail, read the newsletter. gentleman says that you have written an article and, and have said that the Constitution of the United States was airtight insofar as capitalism was concerned. Now he desires to know whether or not you have made any effort to draw up your own Constitution. The answer is no to both part of the question. I never said any such thing. I didn't say it was airtight. I specifically said it had contradiction and flaws which destroyed capitalism. Even in Atlas Shrugged, at the end, I indicate uh, a judge uh, writing amendments to, to a proper, properly restored constitution, which incidentally would be the job of a lawyer, a judge, a philosopher of law which is a great and very complex specialty. I wouldn't dream of uh, writing a constitution sort of at home between doing other jobs. <laughs> Will you give your opinions of the f on the foreign policy of the present administration? Well, will you tell me what the policy is? <laughs> All I can say is just as inconsistent as the domestic policy. 
I don't. I had hoped almost that the recognition of China was Nixon's play against Russia, but that isn't what it is. In the disgraceful performance at the UN, I would say the office boy of Monaco could defeat Mr. Nixon in any foreign uh, negotiations, let alone the Chinese Communists. They are at least smarter when it comes to that kind of level of politics. What are your thoughts on the morality of abortion? And as preliminary to that, how do you define a human being? A human being is a living entity, and life starts at birth. An embryo is a potential human being. Now, you might argue that medically, doctors consider an embryo alive at, uh, I don't know, six months or eight months. Well, no woman in her right mind would have an abortion that late because it's enormously dangerous to her. Therefore, nature is consistent in the interests of both there. Uh, that's my definition of a human being in the context of your question, because I know what you're driving at. However, what's my position on abortion? I wrote a three-part article on that, and I delivered a lecture on it here in this form, analyzing the papal encyclical, and my lecture and article were entitled Of Living Death. I am in favor of abortion, of birth control, of everything connected with sex as an absolute right of the parties involved and of no one else. I also believe that the right of a living human being comes above any potential human being. I never in, in, uh, equate the potential with the actual in any issue. But what's more important, if you're going to make a case for the fact that a potential human being is entitled to life, then I would say all of us are murderers every moment that we don't spend in bed trying to reproduce. <laughs> Come on. What is your opinion on gun control law? I do not know enough about it to have an opinion. I only do believe that it's not of primary importance. I do not believe that forbidding or, uh, guns or registering them is going to stop criminals from having them, nor do I believe that it will be a great threat to the private citizen if he, uh, I mean, a non-criminal citizen, if he is, has to register the fact that he has a gun. I don't know. It's really not very important unless you are ready to prepare a private uprising right now, and I don't think that's very practical. Come on. What practical and positive suggestions do you have to a parent who is eager uh, to take steps so as not to destroy uh, the child's mind and to keep the child eager? Uh, the best, best antidote is the Montessori system of education, uh, which I have mentioned in Kampashiko's article and also there was an article in my magazine, The Objectivist, on the Montessori method. By, uh, the Montessori system, however, deals primarily with nursery school. That is, it gives a proper foundation to a child, after which he would be safe and impervious. Uh, if you send him to uh, the worst of today high schools, he may not be very happy, but they won't affect him if he's had a Montessori training. 
more than that, there are two books which were reviewed in the Objectors, which uh, are called Teaching Montessori in the Home, which is for parents who cannot afford a private nursery school or uh, who find that there is none in their particular district. Uh, they are very good books. It's by Elizabeth Hainstock, and it's called Teaching Montessori in the uh, Home, the preschool years and the school years. Uh, it's in two parts. And she covers precisely this subject and covers the advice, uh, specific practical advice to parents on how to start your child on the Montessori method and how to help him thereafter when he goes uh, into public school. Also, I understand that there are Montessori groups which are beginning to develop possibly a high school based on the Montessori method because there are writings on, her, on that subject but not as detailed as on the uh, kindergarten or uh, nursery school level. And there are already attempts or plans being made to carry that system further, which I think would be the greatest movement in this country so far, the most hopeful. And what's wonderful about it is that it was completely grassroots, unorganized, unplanned. It was groups of parents who started schools for their children because they were appalled at what was being done to the children, so-called progressive nursery school. Uh, there's no vested interest, no particular push behind the movement. It is truly spontaneous, and it is spreading and with marvelous results. Therefore, any uh, questions in regard to child education start with Montessori's own books and then uh, look into the existing Montessori schools. Not all of them are fully reliable. Some of them are slightly mixed or trying to combine two different systems, but still you learn more, your child will learn more than you will get anywhere else today. Come on, come on. <laughs> I, I, the reason that I laugh is I predicted when I was talking to Ms. Rand in the green room that you would, that a question like that would be asked, but I'll repeat it. Are you working on a new novel, and if so, can you say when you expect to finish it? At the moment, no. As I told you last year, I was working, but uh, during this year, I've made a significant change in my publication. That is, instead of the Objectivist magazine coming out once a month, I'm now publishing the Ayn Rand letter, which comes out twice a month, or rather uh, fortnightly. And that takes up a great deal of my time, particularly the organization and the transition to this new form. So at the moment, I can do nothing else. My ultimate plan is to organize my time in such a way that I would be able to work on the novel systematically. Uh, but at present, it's the beginning of a very complex undertaking. And uh, so I, in all honesty, I have to say, no, not right now, I'm not. But I do hope I won't uh, be uh, giving you an excuse each time uh, that I come here. So someday I may announce it. But don't push me. I truly don't know. The gentleman way in back. Wait a minute. Not you. This gentleman here. I'll come to you in a minute. Come on. This round, within the uh, system of government that you advocate, express the need for objective law. When you say uh, within the legal system of many societies there is a place for common law, which is just it's not legislated, it's generally passed down to precedents, it is based on uh, local judicial decisions and sometimes on custom. Quite frequently this law contradicts itself. When you say that within your system of objective law, within the kind of government that you advocate, there would be a place for common law. Would you say that in the kind of government that you advocate there would be a place for common law. I don't, have not yet written the constitution of my government and I don't intend to. If you ask me in principle, is there any necessity for common law, don't ask me what I would do in my society. There is no such thing. Uh, 
common law is a very good institution in the same way as witch doctors were at one time a good institution because some of their discoveries were a primitive form of medicine. And to that extent, they achieved something. But once you have a science of medicine, you don't uh, go back to witch doctors. In the same way, common law in many instances uh, established by popular tradition or inertia some proper principles and in other cases some dreadful principles. Once a, a civilization has grasped the concept of law and particular basic law, a constitution, common law becomes unnecessary and should certainly not be regarded as law. Any, uh, in a free society anyone can have any customs they want, but that is not law. Way up and back, the gentleman that I said I'd recognize. Come on. I think that uh, this grand may be gratified to know that as a result of her philosophy in the upcoming federal elections in Canada, there is two treatment of federal students who are advocates of what they fair capitalism. This gentleman says that you would perhaps be interested to learn, Miss Rand, that in the upcoming elections in Canada, there are two or three uh, candidates who are outright supporters of the laissez-faire economy. No, I didn't know this. If so, I wish them luck, but <laughs> if so. Come on. You said the U.S. should maintain nuclear superiority over the United States. I'm curious, do you ever advocate that they actually use these weapons? You say that the... Yes. Yeah. Yes, I get it. I get it. Uh, do you... You say that the United States uh, should be the ones in basic control of the nuclear uh, weapons as opposed to the use by China and Russia, and would you advocate that the United States ever use them? I would not dispose of the lives of other people, and it is improper to put me in the position of a commander's chief ask the question in principle. Is it proper for an individual to defend himself? Yes. Is it proper for a country to defend itself? Yes. Are Russia and China monstrous aggressors which, uh, whose first aggression is against their own people? Yes. If so, certainly we should have superiority over all of them and we should not attack them, but we don't have to. At the first sign of an attack from them, we should fight them by every means we have. Because I think it is criminal to kill American men and not use better weapons which we do have. Judge Ruiz, I haven't finished. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, because he had a Go uh, ahead. footnote yes. about war killing innocent people. Yes. Why do you think people should be concerned about the nature of their government? Certainly the majority in any country at war is innocent. But if by neglect, ignorance or helplessness, they couldn't... Uh, overturn or choose a, a bad government and choose a better one, then they have to pay the price for the sins of their government, as all of us are paying for the sins of ours. That's why we have to be interested in the philosophy of government and in seeing to the extent we can, seeing to it that we have a good government, because a government is not an independent entity. It's supposed to represent the people of a nation. If some people put up with Soviet uh, dictatorship, not all of them, you know, but some do, as they did in Germany, they deserve whatever their government deserves. There is no innocent people in war. The only thing to be concerned with is who started that war. And once you can establish that it's a given country, there is no such thing as considerations for the right of that country because it has initiated the use of force and therefore stepped outside the principle of right.
but I've covered that in better detail in uh, the nature of government. Uh, take a look at that in um, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, where I explain why nations as such do not have any rights. Governments have no rights, only individuals have. This lady, come on. Uh, you mentioned in an earlier statement that uh, the government saw the masses as a broad way to the people after taking the place from the, uh, yeah. the people in power. What is your uh, idea of, of the masses, not those that are groveling, but those that have no talent and are simply eager to earn a living? Uh, two things. There is no human being who has no talent. Every human being, if he uses his mind, has talent to that extent. He should not be pretentious and he shouldn't aspire to more than he is able to understand and produce with his own mind. But there is no such thing as a worthless human being. He makes himself that. There is no such thing as the little people. But now let's suppose that uh, a class or a group of people of such limited intelligence that they really are pretty helpless. Well, if you are concerned with them, you should be more of an advocate of the exceptional man than I am, if it's possible, because it is only by means of the work of the better minds of and in a free society that those uh, really helpless people, if they exist, can survive at all. They couldn't survive in a more primitive society. It is only in an industrial society that they can survive. And an industrial society can exist only in freedom. But this to answer your practical question, but before one even considers it, Shouldn't one ask why is anybody entitled to concern, interest, and sympathy because he is undistinguished? If there are such people, and that's your uh, choice of words, not mine, then I would say they deserve no further interest. Because what we should be interested in is the talented, the intelligent, the hardworking, the ambitious, the people who want to carry their own weight and make something of themselves. And that's the overwhelming majority of Americans. other than atheism and religion do you have with William Buckley, Jr.? <laughs> May I? I will have to answer you speaking this way because well, I can't turn my well, he back can, he on can the mic. He can hear you. He can hear you. It would be simpler if you ask me what similarity do we have, <laughs> and I would say none. A difference such as reason versus mysticism is so much more fundamental, if one can use the term, it affects so much more than politics that politics isn't even important in that context. The first issue is reason versus irrationality, mysticism, faith, and an organized faith. The next reason is morality after which you can come to politics. Now, Mr. Buckley, and I, I, I assume you mean the whole conservative movement, which he represents. They advocate religion and an organized religion, a religion which in its past history and present attempts, it's very interested in politics. In other words, what they have in mind is a theocracy, a society ruled by religious, functionaries, which we haven't had since pre-Middle Ages. It's one of the most primitive uh, societies there is, like ancient Egypt, is an example of theocracy. The union of 
uh, Catholic Church and State in the late Middle Ages, early Renaissance, uh, which was responsible for the Inquisition, is an example of theocracy. The view that man is a low-grade, helpless sinner and worm, that the life on earth is a, I don't know, a den of iniquity or a bale of tears or whatever they call it, <laughs> and the idea that man must not aspire to solve his problems by using his mind, which is what they accused the liberal movement of the 19th century, which isn't the same as today, when man liberal movement really stood for individual rights, freedom, and free enterprise. Uh, and they, the uh, Catholic conservative, uh, well, thinkers, uh, say <laughs> <laughs> that man should not attempt to solve social or earthly problems by means of reason. That's why we failed, because the uh, liberals of the 19th century tried to go by nothing, but also use the expression, the arrogance of reason. We should all bow to the Pope and act on faith, and the Pope is the one who has declared that capitalism is worse than Marxism. And of course, the only morality is the morality of altruism, where it is our duty to sacrifice uh, for the good of others and the glory of God. What is there in common between that and me? <laughs> I just think time has come to express our appreciation to Miss Rand. Thank you. Thank you.